Good evening and welcome to Sustainability Workshop number eight as part of our year-long workshop series. Today's workshop is Dune Restoration and Vegetation. My name is Nick Sanzone, and I'm going to take you through today's presentation workshop as part of our Sustainability Action Plan Sustainability Workshop series presented by the City of Satellite Beach. So today the coastal community of Satellite Beach has approximately three miles of beachfront. That beachfront property has approximately 40% that's been acquired by the city of Satellite Beach. This property is used for a number of different purposes, ranging from recreation and community involvement to 100% restoration areas. That 40% has 13 crossover locations where residents can access the beach. Uh, those access points, those crossovers, look like this. And in 2011, the most recent study that the city performed, 84% of the city's residents supported the acquisition of property to limit shoreline development. And we are currently in the city of Salad Beach uh, built out for the most part. And the acquisition of 40% of that beachfront property is very rare among coastal communities. However, it helps a lot when it comes to protecting against the impacts of hurricanes and natural occurring erosion and just the general effects of nature itself. We're going to go over that. First, we're going to start with the history. Underneath our feet in Satellite Beach, we have Coquina Rock, and that Coquina Rock stretches out into the beach underneath the sand and is exposed just offshore. And this Coquina Rock is about 120,000 years old, deposited through time. The process of lithification has created Coquina Rock, a combination of shell fragments that through chemical processes have become a rock layer. That rock layer is where the beach and the dune system rests upon that layer. That Anastasia line stone formation, that Anastasia formation is what's underneath our feet and it stretches all the way to Jacksonville and just south down to Jupiter. You can visit Blowing Rocks Preserve down there and you can actually see it exposed 100%. The dune ecology that we're talking about of Florida on the beach, there's over 1,300 miles of coastline in Florida, 800 miles of that are sandy beaches. And that's what we're talking about today. So over time, the history of that dune formation through those processes of ice ages and sea level rise and fall, eroding coastlines, creating shorelines, moving them, creating that Anastasia limestone formation, allows for the coastline we have today through wind processes and vegetative uh, growth that has been stabilized through a number of different plant types. And the function of those plants are to be salt tolerant, to reduce erosion, to create habitat. So, this list of plants is rather long. There's a number of grasses, other herbaceous plants, and trees and shrubs. I'm going to highlight three of them today that we can talk about and when you visit this presentation online at satellitebeachflorida.org, you can check out the actual list. There's also a wonderful list on our city website, and those links are provided at the end of the presentation. The three plants we're going to talk about, sea oats, beach sunflower, and sea grapes. Sea oats are commonly used in restoration practices because they're one of the first plants that exists on the toe slope of the dune. Saltier environment, very harsh environment, high winds, very uh, direct sunlight, no shade, requires a very hardy plant. Uh, most recently, over $800,000 worth of sea oats were planted by the county along the coastline in front of our beach, as well as the beaches south of us as well, approximately 20 miles of shoreline. Uh, those sea oats are planted next to other vegetative species like dune sunflower. I like to use dune sunflower because it's very beautiful. It's very easy to distinguish. And it does a really good job of holding the soil together and allowing other plants to grow underneath it because it is one of these plants that grow outward very rapidly, as opposed to the sea oak, which takes a little more time. If we continue up the slope of the dune, we'll make our way to where the sea grape makes its home. And the sea grape has these large elephant ear-like leaves, and the grapes themselves can actually be made into jelly. 
That's not the tastiest jelly, but it's a good jelly. So sea grape provides a great habitat, provides some shade, allows for some of the wildlife to get out of the sun during the hot summer months. This dune ecology, you can look down here, this is a picture coming from Hightower Beach and Satellite. It's our most northern beach access, and then it has a large, one of the largest acreages of actual conservation land in the city of Satellite Beach. When we talk about the beaches being formed over time, we like to look at this thing called the toral drift, the idea that the sand is always moving. So the beach is moving, it's changing the location of the sand through wind, erosion, and the toral drift. As the waves push the sand towards the shore, the zigzag movement of sand moves it back out and northern. It keeps going to the north, and as the sand moves, the coastline changes. The rocks get filled in with sand. Different creatures and animals live in this transitional ephemeral zone of the coastline. They make their way up to the shore. Birds that live on the shore that feed off of the rack seaweed, all the seaweed that washes up into the high tide line. You can see here the dark images on the beach. That's where the seaweed is. That habitat makes way to the more harsh zone before we get to the sea oats, the doom sunflower, and the sea grape. And the salinity in those three zones really helps determine which plants are going to live there. Salt tolerance is a limiting factor when it comes to the transitional plants of the dune ecosystem. The frontal zone, that's where you're going to find your sea oats. Your back dune zone is typically where you're going to find your dune sunflower. And your forest zone is where you're going to find your sea grapes. And of course, like I showed earlier, there's a number of other plants that exist in those different zones. That list is very long, and again, we have it on our website, as well as uh, the NRCS and the DEP websites that are provided at the end of the presentation. So, some quick notes on restoration. The idea of restoration uh, is a really an, an old idea, and it's something that's been happening for a long time, and it takes a long time to actually occur. Restoration can take sometimes 30 years to see a final product, because the scientists involved, the governments involved, have to go through a number of procedures, meetings, and uh, they have to look at the details of that particular site. They want to be site specific when deciding a restoration plan because not every site is the same. So when we talk about the restoration of a dune ecosystem, we might talk about vegetation, uh, the grain size, the composition of the sand that's being used on the beach, and all those things have been looked into at recent beach renourishment activity here in Satellite. And we're happy to see the sea oaks that were planted most recently still there after a number of months. It's been really wonderful. It takes time. So even those sea oaks that were planted, they have to establish root systems and make themselves stable. Then other plants will make their way into that stable ecosystem. So the time is a big factor, but also paperwork. You have to get the right permits to make all these things happen. That adds to the time involved. You have to get approval from those local governments and municipalities and everybody that's working together. The funding for that, well that takes even longer because you have to apply for that before the project gets started. And the material gathering, once you do get funded and the paperwork is filed, it takes a while to make sure that all your materials are ready together. $800,000 worth of sea oats takes a long time to make sure that your sand is delivered on time. That takes time and money. And to gather all those materials and get them to the right location takes a lot of coordination from various parties. When it comes to the planting efforts, sometimes they're done by the government agencies, the county, the state, the cities, or individuals and non for profits like Surfrider Foundation. Surfrider Foundation uh, does a number of planting activities throughout our state and specifically our city. They planted roughly over 10,000 sea oats in the past five, uh, five years every year, so between five and 10,000 every year. That's pretty impressive. And we're going to be working with them in February, so if you are around in February, you want to come on out and join us for a sea oak planting day with Surfrider in February, check out the Facebook page at gogreensb.org, check out our website, check out the Surfrider website, and make sure that you're informed about these types of activities going on in your community. Now, those goals remain the same. No matter where you are, it's always going to be coastal stabilization and erosion control. That's the main idea behind that restoration. Creation of habitat, of course, but the stabilization of that unique ecosystem is really important. 
Like I mentioned, the importance of the restoration also includes habitat recreation. So we lose a lot of this habitat due to erosion, hurricanes, and sometimes development. Sometimes somebody moves into a building or they build something and they need to mitigate the, that development. That happens often in numerous communities, so they need to replant afterwards. That's usually part of a number of plants that happen when developing coastal communities. The invasive removal is something that has to be ongoing because sometimes when you move into a, a location and you uh, construct either a park or a natural area, sometimes invasive species can move into areas that have been disturbed. And those are the things we want to avoid. So you work with your local SISMA team to remove them, work with your local city to remove them. And if it's a resident that has invasives on their property, they can also contact the city for resources to learn about how to remove them properly without harming native plants, and then learn which native plants to replace those invasives. Public access. This picture here specifically looks at Hightower Beach, again, the most northern beach, and it has a wonderful boardwalk that extends over a natural area where you can find all the native plants I mentioned, as well as stinging nettle, some cactuses, saw palmetto, and a variety of other species of native plants that provide habitat for that unique ecosystem. The scrub jay habitat is one of those ecosystems that is very rare in Florida, and that's what we want to protect is these rare habitats that are unique, that serve as a cornerstone for specific species to grow and thrive. Not only do they provide that habitat, they also provide a windbreak. So when there is a storm event, it provides a windbreak against that on the either habitats of the wildlife or the habitats of the people that live there. Any legal, legal issues that may arise as a part of that restoration process, they can involve anything from a homeowner that needs to restore their shoreline after the erosion that has occurred through a storm event, and to make sure that we don't end up with uh, seawalls and things of that nature on our beaches, we try to promote responsible coastal management and sometimes coastal retreat. The idea of managing this habitat wisely and looking at long-term benefits of renourishment in some cases is the better choice as opposed to some options like seawalls. But ideally, we want to try to find a way to take this land and create more of a restoration use for that land if it is continually eroded. So there's lots of different legal ways to evolve to take care of those types of situations. So restorations examples and some of the ones that I've already talked about include those in Brevard County here in Florida, Satellite Beach, the city that we're in, and the nonprofits of Surfrider and other commercial uh, entities include hotels, residential entities include residents. So for Brevard County, they've been doing a project that took about 30 years to kind of get started. There was a lot of things they wanted to get right, so they took their time doing it. In Satellite Beach, again, we try to make sure we can purchase as much land as possible to provide a preservation area for these natural areas so that they can thrive and protect them and make sure we inform our citizens not to walk over them because walking through them can damage those ecosystems because they are very fragile yet very critical to the habitat of the wildlife that lives there. The nonprofits like Surfrider, like I mentioned, they do a number of events and we support those and hopefully you can come on out and join us for the next one in February of 2019. And commercial hotels, recently the Doubletree Hotel in the Atlantic uh, contacted DEP to understand more about the sea grape trimming and what they're allowed to do to trim sea grapes uh, to make sure that they don't harm the sea turtle habitat on the beach side. So once we cross over that dune and we're in the zone closest to the ocean. Well, that zone is where the sea turtles like to live and they depend a lot on that area not being too bright so that they know when to lay eggs and they don't get confused. In order to keep that area nice and dark, we want to make sure that our sea grapes are full and trimming them in a specific way is very important. So the DEP has regulations on how to do that. And those links are at the end of the presentation as well. For individual residents, those same regulations apply. And typically what it means is that if you are landward of the dune crest by anywhere between you know, zero and 35 feet, 
you fall within that DEP category that requires you to contact them about trimming that area because it is critical habitat. So those are some of the information that we wanted to provide as part of this workshop in workshop number eight. The main friendly reminder at the end here is to follow the rules and respect the beach. All these rules and information are out there and accessible through the links provided as well as through your local municipality. Wherever you are in the world, remember to keep off the dunes. It's a vital habitat. It is very important to a number of wildlife species, sea turtles, scrub jays, as well as your fellow man. So with that, here are some of those links provided. Florida DEP, City of Satellite Free Beach has the municipal code R7 Division 1 in landscaping that talks about all these different plants and which ones are suited for these different areas. The Sebastian Inlet, Inlet Surf Rider Foundation has a Facebook page as well as a great online presence where you can find out more information about their programs. And RevardFlorida.gov slash natural resources is a great way to learn about the resources in this county. If you're looking to volunteer, you can always contact the City of Satellite Beach to get involved in any one of these programs. We do have a volunteer opportunity coming up in September. And that's gonna be our volunteer planting day on September 1st from nine to one. The next workshop that we're gonna have is September 27th. That's gonna be our community garden and seasonal workshop where we're gonna kick off year two of our community garden. If you're interested, contact me. My name is Nick Sanzone. I'm the environmental programs coordinator for the city. Call me anytime, give me an email. I'll be happy to talk with you about this and any number of our other topics covered in our sustainable workshop series. Again, thank you for attending this workshop. And here is our next volunteer opportunity on September 1st from 9 to 2 here in Satellite Beach. Thank you very much.